So I hope I'm going to fill in some gaps and expand some ideas, that, things we've already talked about. So I'm a clinical nurse specialist in psychiatry, which is kind of the equivalent of nurse practitioner psychiatry, and, but in this state, the original nomenclature for us were clinical nurse specialist. So first we're going to talk about the limbic system uh, is this picture, but I want to just point out a couple things about this uh, photo here, because you've seen some of the brain pictures before, but the cottage is they're talking about, if you remember the picture before, it kind of wraps like a horn around like this. But this area here is the motor cortex. This area here is sensory. Down here is the temporal lobe, which is the site of lots of emotion and rage. And the amygdala sits right in here, which is the fright flight, huge issue of anxiety. And a little loop in here is the hippocampus, which is the site where short-term memory is, is stored. And also there's issues about anxiety and mood disorder in that area. And so when you look at the relationship with this basal ganglia caudate area, the caudate sits in that little bulb, it really crosses over all these areas. It also is very close and very highly connected with intrahighway neurons to the frontal cortex, which has greatly impacted on cognitive issues with this disorder. So um, I'm going to offer you some thinking about how to explain PANS to your child. You've heard of all these things, but if you talk about brain inflammation, they're going to look like you're crazy. Um, so first of all, you talk about germs. These are things they know about from, you know, you always talk about wash your hands. Um, and some people, what we talk about is are, there's good bacteria and there's bad things in our bodies and outside, and that's why we wash our hands and we cut our food in the right way and we cook our food to certain temperatures. But what you can tell them is all of our bodies have highly developed military to keep our enemies away. And there's four types of military. I'm not including the Coast Guard, unfortunately. But first we have the Marines. That's IGM, so you can remember M for Marine. The Marines are always prepared for a quick strike attack. They patrol everywhere. The Marines manage things like your exposure to strep normally or uh, staphylococcus or things that are on the surfaces of your life. The next one is the Air Force. This is IGE. The Air Force dive bombs. Think of the bombers. They come in and they react to specific things, mosquito bites, peanut allergies, seasonal allergies, um, and anaphylaxis. Most children, even young children, are aware of peanut allergies because so many of their classmates prohibit them bringing peanut, peanut products to school. The last uh, third area is the Army. That's IGA. The Army, I consider, is the boots on the ground, the dirt of your life. So as Ken mentioned, it's ear, nose, and throat, digestive, bowel, and bladder. So all your mucosal lining, that tennis court he showed you. And this is specific to that area. The IgA is specific to the mucosal lining. And then I may have to change Navy to TH17. But Navy is IgG. And know, many of you know you're measuring IgG. Right? And when you're measuring IgG. But I saw IgG, if you measure mycoplasma or mono or any of these infections, when you read your lab reports, IgM, the Marines are attacking, that's an active state of infection. IgG in those measurements is the post infective state. So if you have an IgG elevation of mycoplasma, it means you did have some exposure infection to the pneumonia, but you're not currently considered an active state of illness. So the Navy gets there a little slower. You know, we send out ships now and they show up about two weeks later in the Middle East, right? So they float in the, the IgG is in all your fluid. And just like the Navy showing up a little late in the Middle East, if you know, remember, when you check titers, they often don't peak until eight, six to eight weeks out from infection. We've heard about this with Korea showing up six to eight weeks after infection. And what I want you to tell your children is when you have these Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, intelligence is a very important part of a defense system. And the Navy, in this case, has received the wrong intelligence. And they watch all these shows now with, you know, soldiers and they both play um, Halo and all these games that have all these fighting people. But what you need to tell them is that part of your brain tricked the, uh, or the, the antibody in the brain were tricked into giving the wrong intelligence. So I say that the Navy is floating around in your brain and it's decided that it should be shelling the basal ganglia. And um, now that shelling causes swelling and it causes injury. And when you want to explain brain swelling, you remind them of what a mosquito bite looks like or a cut looks like. 
it gets red, it gets swollen, it's enlarged, but over time it goes away. And that's what your immune system is there for. And they will understand this. I use this with very young children, and they kind of understand at least enough that you have some sense of how to explain this to him. And also that this intelligence can be confusing for some time to come. Now, the next thing is you want to know, and this is some of work of Tamara Chansky, who writes in OCD terms, do you know who is talking to you? This is another conversation you want to talk to your child about, somewhat of what we've already had from Micho. Um, so give PANS a name or a code word sometimes. She mentioned identifying it as OCD. But, you know, if there's a certain character in your life, your Uncle Mike or some cartoon character that you kind of don't like that is an irritant, you can, you know, in public you can go, oh, that's Uncle Mike, you know. You can kind of lighten it a bit but also give it meaning that it's an irritant, that it's a problem, it's in your way. You also want to say, who's calling when this brain stuff is going on? If you're answering the phone, they all know what uh, caller ID. Many kids won't even answer the phone if the caller ID doesn't say who's on there. So when this messaging is going on in your brain, again, you ask, well, who's calling? And you want to know, is this message you are about to hear notoriously unreliable, distorted, and out of proportion? And this is kind of the language you do with OCD and any kind of misfiring of anxiety or OCD, even ticks are a misfiring of the message. Flares are very important to recognize, I just mentioned them, and they're not all defeating, back. they do feel back to square one certainly in a lot of cases, but people usually do resolve flares rather quickly if you've already had a treatment response. And then you wanna ask yourself, well what am I treating? So you do have to look at the different pieces, and this guides treatment as well. So are you treating anxiety, generalized anxiety, specific, you know, or specific anxiety? We heard about vomiting phobia is very common, <coughs> separation anxiety. This is where they can't go to school, they can't go to sleep, other phobias they develop, OCD tics, eating disorders, urinary urgency. So I'm going to spend a little time on some of these areas to define them better for you in ways you can hopefully use this also with your child. Anxiety is a multi-system defense to threat or danger. It's a natural part of our bodies. And in that anxiety, there's a concept of emotion. These are the chemical changes that impact mood, how we feel. And affect, we use the word affect. What's the affect? That's a common psychiatric term. Affect is what I say you look like, not how you feel. Fear is a very direct focus response to something very specific. Most of the time in anxiety disorders, Fear, fear is there in OCD in very extreme ways in traditional OCD, but anxiety disorders, separation anxiety, fear, it's often not around a specific, you know, if you have a child who's phobic about going to school, they can't really tell you what they're fearing, they just can't get out the door. But there's a qualitative difference that I've learned over the years dealing with pandas, which is this fear, is, it's very fear, is not just anxiety, there is a kind of intensity of fear that harm will be done and the child is not often able to, and especially in the flared position and the, you know, the exacerbation, they're not able to distinguish between fear, which is true object-oriented, you know, if I leave, you are going to die, versus I have this idea that if I leave, you, some harm might come. Um, and it's just a much higher intense elevation. And our bodies are designed chemically to respond to fear at a more heightened fright-flight level, fight-flight level, than they are about anxiety. And that's like common, it appears, appears to be very high in pans. And what do you do with an anxiety attack? So some of the ideas that I think would be helpful are the concept, and uh, Micho again did some comments about this, what goes up comes down. You saw the spike and flow of stuff. Adrenaline has a very distinct elevation, lasts for 10 or 15 minutes, and then it starts dropping. So if you actually time the intensity of the anxiety, it's often 20 or 30 minutes long. And then, can you understand that, is this a big feeling, a medium feeling, or a manageable feeling? So, to start to break out and differentiate, what level of anxiety is this when you're having a conversation? Common triggers in most children are fatigue, poor diets, overstimulation, but in pandas, now you've got this layer of neurologic irritation. I thought this quote was very helpful, I can't claim it for my own. Your heart is pounding because you are upset, not because you have to do something quickly. So when we're dealing with our kids in anxiety attacks, we feel from our own adrenaline drive, the drive to fly, you know, to run or to fight. And what you want to fight is your child's anxiety. You want to run. Megan said, I want to put her in a hospital or I want to discharge her from my life. 
That's your response. And so you want to also start separating out what your child's issue is at the time versus your own heart rate, your own adrenaline, and your own desire to fix it. Because well intended, you can start to all stumble into each other with the anxiety. And in the heat of the meltdown are the major moments. Reasoning does not work. Now, anxiety, flight, fight, as I mentioned, fight, flight, is this is a physiological phenomena of adrenaline, and it causes a number of things we've talked about, but just a little more detail. It's hyperarousal, so their eyes are dilated, and they can have more awakeness. This is often the trouble going to bed at night. They're much more awake because they're fearful about that process of separation. Their heart rate and breathing can be up. People have pounding chests. Their breathing increases. Much more muscle tension. You see more physical activity. This is where they might choose to bang, break, kick, because they've got high muscle tension. So if you can actually run them up and down the stairs or around the dining room table a couple times, sometimes that breaks through some of the stuff. Or take a vigorous walk, go shoot some hoops. Um, and this is also what leads to stomach aches because in order to have that muscle energy, the blood flow leaves your stomach, leaving no real digestive activity. And this is off of the morning activity and the evening when stomach aches will really be hard to measure or to manage. Tools that are used often in the psychiatry area for measurement of anxiety, one very common one they'll use is called the Child Behavioral Checklist. And many of these tools that I'm going to mention are just kind of checklists. What does your child look like? It might be a, what we call a Likert scale, one to five, you know, from minimal to very maximal. Other symptoms of anxiety, particularly panic anxiety, is headache, lightheaded or dizziness, nausea and or vomiting. You can vomit with panic. Diarrhea, numbness or tingling, especially in fingers, feet, and face. And I hear a lot of parents surprised when I ask that. The kids often report it to me if I ask specifically, but often the parents didn't connect that that complaint was part of the adrenaline drive. Pale complexion, many people said they're, so, they're pale, they change, their body changes, their eyes widen, they get pale. Trembling, shaking, some of them look like they're having a seizure. Sweating, tightness in the pain or chest and neck. In the adult world with anxiety, more people are in the emergency room every year for anxiety, panic attacks, feeling they're having a heart attack, than they are actually having a heart attack, much higher rate. And so you need to appreciate that people often feel in a system of panic attack that they're dying. And that's what drives now the fear. That's a different level of anxiety than just I'm gonna be sick. I'm dying, I'm dying. And panic attack, you're gonna, again, it's extreme fear, it's a higher rate. And it lasts, again, as I mentioned, uh, from minutes to hours. If they keep getting stimulated by something that they're fearful of, if it's a phobia that's still present, if it's an anxiety they've gotten really perseverative about or obsessive about, it's harder and sometimes you have a harder time bringing it down. But remember that many panic attacks are very time limited. Fear and panic and pans, um, this is a real, it, it took me a while to get this differentiation, but I was very puzzled by it at first. A typical child and adolescent, when they go in my office and talk about anxiety and OCD, there's very typical prescriptive kind of evaluations we're asking, certain questions we're asking. And most kids in typical anxiety and OCD can pretty much tell you the answer. Um, certainly the parents have flushed out the OCD before I see the child, but they can talk about it, they can agree with you whether they do or do not tie their shoes 10 times each day, you know. But when the child is highly PANS related, I have found that they sit with this frozen, nonverbal ability to talk. Uh, they can't tell you about it, they can't describe it, they can't explain it. And if you don't interview the parent first without the child in the room, you will lack a tremendous amount of data. And also, I think it's extremely painful for the child to hear the detail of their dysfunction at this level. Um, they're very embarrassed and shamed. Remember, these are child who typically were, quote, normal. They know they were normal. That's different than a child who has a preceding anxiety or OCD disorder or ADHD, who everybody's kind of learning along their lifeline that they have issues. We all know that Janie's anxious, you know, or Joey asks 10 questions before we leave in the morning, or so-and-so has transition issues. Those are kind of common dialogues in families. But this being such an overnight transformation, where's your language for this? So again, ask the parent before. And I call this the invasion of the body snatchers. I think one of the most extreme, vivid examples of this was my client um, who, when I was, inter I had interviewed the mother quite extensively before I saw the child, um, but we were talking about 
the experience and he was kind of sitting on the couch and I see kids shrink away from me sometimes when I start asking even the details. And mom finally said and turned to him and said, oh, should we tell her about Mike? Now his name was Henry. And I said, well, who's Mike? And she said, oh, well, when we were in the flare last before it was fall, when he couldn't go to school, he sat on the couch, curled up in a blanket, a hoodie over his head. When I called his name Henry, he said, Mom, don't call me Henry, call me Mike. Because Henry's gone. It's Mike. I mean, he named his pandas Mike because it was so different for him to experience this relationship. Um, and so I think this is important for kids to understand and kind of talk about with them. Now, Another thing is helpful maneuvers, because people are going to say, well, what do I do? I, some of the questions that came up. So again, with Tamara Chansky's help, saying empathy, again, not necessarily trying to fix it, because as you've learned, you can't always make an intervention. So, but empathy, this feels really bad right now. We're all miserable. Normalizing, I think anybody would feel upset in this situation. Validating, I, it seems right now nothing you can do is right for you. And maybe sometimes you're saying, I'm sorry, nothing I can do right now for you is right. You know, you can't change it when you should be able to as a parent in your mind and in their mind. What, why aren't you helping me, Mom? This is terrible. Make it in a manageable size. Let's work on this when you're ready. Or in the charts of small and large, temperature charts, uh, number charts, stair charts, how big does this field you right now? Is this a three? Is this a six? Is this a nine? Are we in stair one, stair 10? So that you've kind of, again, developed um, language to kind of communicate to each other, especially when you're in a flare or a meltdown. Um, problem solving. Can we think of what your choices are to fix this? So to try and get the child to now think, what are some choices we have? It's not a choice that we ask 10 more times, you know, a question in an obsessive way. Um, choices to move on. What can help faster to move this along? Sometimes you have to divert their attention. This is very true in any anxiety or OCD. You have to get them to start thinking about something else. Should we take a walk? Does a dog need to go out for pee? Um, you know, I think we better go to the store now because we have to buy something. I have to get dinner on the table. So there's something. What, what else can we do now instead of be fussing about this and scared, you know, scared about this? And so what do you need to do to move on? In a total meltdown, which all of you, by the way, how many of you had meltdowns before you left this weekend for your children? as you left out the door. Somebody showed me a scratch on their arm last night. Yeah. Um, this is a talk from Tony Atwood, who's an Asperger expert. And um, Asperger kids have massive meltdowns on a regular basis when they're overloaded sensory and they're overloaded with their anxiety. So I think his ideas are very helpful in that massive meltdown point, where you're not going to say, where can we go with this right now? You, you can't even have a dialogue. So you stay calm and reassuring. You stay with the person, but distant physically. Many of these kids cannot stand to be touched or be physically close when they're in this meltdown. And if you try, you're going to get hit. Um, do not ask what is causing distress. Let it just be, be said, be stated. Do not try and fix it. Do not move too close. Briefly explain that the feeling will go away. This is temporary. We've been through this before. It's going to end. Let's, you know, again, try and if there are any soothing or diverting techniques and minimal conversation or distraction. Because when you try and disrupt a person in a panic, they cannot cognitively manage your words, your actions, at the same time their brain is totally overwhelmed with fight or flight. They can't cognitively take it in. Now, I'm not going to do much on this discussion since it's been well covered, but I want to comment on one area in particular. And this was also a question that came up, is sexual or forbidden thoughts? This is not an uncommon OCD thing in, in general, but in children with OCD pandas, it's even more distressful often. One of my clients right now is asking, did she have the baby? Did she have sex with that man? Now, her father is reasonably concerned that if she starts saying this to other people, and this has happened to other people, that they'll be investigated for child sexual abuse. And many of you have commented that when you've been brought to hospitals or evaluated, everybody is looking, where's the trauma? Where's the abuse? Um, again, you've heard of all these uh, activities. And I just want to mention the CY box because it's been talked about a lot, but it hasn't really been explained. These are measures of how obsession and compulsions and a measurement that's very accurate of how disruptive it is, actually. Because a lot of you have OCD. 
But that doesn't mean it's disrupting your life to a point of debilitation. So it has two pages on it, two, two scoring areas. One is a listing, obsession and compulsion, and then a child reflects with the therapist, is it the past month or past three months, whatever the therapist decides is a measuring tool, and then is it current or is it past? Because some kids, as you know, will move through different OCD behaviors, and it might be that last year I was tying my shoes and touching the washer. This year it might be I'm um, a fearful of vomit. So there's different ones, and so you want to kind of gather a history of both past and present. The second area is the measurement then of how much is this interfering with life, how much time does this take in your day, how many hours do you spend doing these things, both thinking and action, how much is it interfering, and how much distress is it causing you. Again, you can have this huge lift of OCD, but if the kid says, eh, you know, it's all right, I'm moving around life, I'm going through it, like that. you know, it doesn't interfere that much, okay. So then those are scored into mild, moderate, severe, and extreme, and subclinical. And generally speaking, in a traditional, I'm making that sure that you hear that traditional OCD, when it's moderate or higher, I'm thinking as a psychopharm person, well, we're going to start with CBT, but if it's severe or extreme, we're probably starting with CBT and medication as fast as possible. Um, but if it's moderate and the patient and family can tolerate it, I'm going to say go see this specialized therapist first. In PANDAS, which I'm going to talk about in a minute with medication, you're, again, if it's relative to the infection, you're treating the infection first and foremost. But it is a very helpful um, uh, tool uh, of measurement. Now, this is about OCD in parents, and again, it was mentioned earlier, but you can be a very unwitting accomplice in the OCD. And, you know, they rope you in, as Megan be beautifully described. You know, first it was this, now I have to answer the question 10 times, and now I didn't say it right, so we have to repeat it 10 more times. So try and step back and get perspective. This is where parents can be very helpful to each other. And this is true in parenting, my experience. My husband would tap me on the shoulder and say, that's not a good, not a good time to talk about that now, honey. You know, where's your underwear? Uh, he lives in college now. You shouldn't be counting how many underwear you're washing for him. Okay, I get it. Um, catch yourself in the act or have somebody else catch yourself in the act because we're so drawn into manage, more, we're trying to help our kids. It's very understood, but you can get really swept into it. Recognize unsustainable commitments. How long can you stay awake at night answering the question? How many times can you repeat something? Uh, you know, how many times can you hear that confession? Um, therapists are extremely helpful in guiding you this way, and this is important that you, you, this is, even if you can't get the kid in the CBT therapist office, you yourself can learn a great deal about what to do and feel relieved somewhat when you say no, because you'll get directed that this is when you should say no, or at least you should attempt to say no, or cut off the repetitions. And this was taught to me when I used to float into an OCD unit at McLean, and I was answering questions, and this person tapped me on the shoulder and said, the rule here is three times you can answer the question, that's it. <laughs> so I went, oh, okay, because I was up to at least six. You know, I was this nurse who was just meeting these people, and they were, oh, they were using me so badly, because then they could talk to me all the time. What about this? What about this? What about this? You know, so the rule of three, and you start to educate your child. When you've asked me that more than three times, I'm going to stop answering. I know that's going to be hard for you. I will even set the timer for 25 minutes or 30 minutes, and you can come back and ask me three more times. But again, you're trying to gradually remove them from being totally overwhelmed by this. And remember, their brain is asking them to be totally overwhelmed by this, and there's no other structure provided unless you're providing it, and then the therapies and the medications. Readiness for CBT, this is a hot topic, and I'm really glad to hear that you commented on this. Um, again, I get a lot of referrals from therapists who the kid was sent to by the pediatrician or that somebody else, and they go, I can't work with them. You know, they're just not there. We've tried. There's something in the way. I've seen some kids do some really good CBT work, but there was just something overwhelming them that could not move them along. Or they didn't even talk in the therapy. That's another, the biggest one is they just don't even open their mouths. The therapist, the mother, sit there and have a chat. And the child says nothing for two or three sessions, and the parents say, well, this is useless. So... Um, you do have to have readiness for CBT, so stabilization, communication, again, preparing them with a therapist and yourself about what exposure work is and child-friendly language. That persuasion, this is, again, the topic is sometimes what, you know, that this is, our life right now is not happy, you're not happy, 
we could try something that might change this, there's no guarantees, but instead of just saying there's nothing we can do, that therapist is useless, you really do want, and it takes work sometimes again to find the OCD therapist. I have the unfortunate experience many times of saying to the family, I know you really like that therapist, you've been with them for two or three years, but they do not know how to do OCD therapy. They have to have an OCD therapist when it's OCD treatment that's needed. CBT in and itself alone, meditation, relaxation therapy, is often not enough, unfortunately. And then it becomes harder because the referral base for OCD therapists are quite slim. Uh, collaboration. Again, your child needs to become a partner. This is really true in therapy. But also freedom of choice is very helpful that they kind of agree with persuasion and a little pushing that they're going to go in at least and sit and listen or hear the options. Ticks and motor ticks. So you've heard a little bit about this. We haven't talked as much, but um, some of the things that people haven't heard so much about smelling things as a, a tick sometimes. Um, <laughs> blowing into their mouth. People have asked me that a lot. Blowing in and smelling their breath or smelling your breath. Um, sometimes a finger snap or an arm snap, which people don't recognize as a tick. Um, vocal clearing, humming, ticking, snuffling, grumbling, grunting. And many times I'll say to the family, um, what about his grunting that I'm hearing in the office and the parent hasn't mentioned it? And they go, oh, oh, th that? So they're so accustomed to it that it's like, you know, the white noise effect, they just turn it off. I also have to say the parent eventually as we go through the interview, um, have you had a blinking tick for a long time? You know, because they're doing this or they, you know. So again, these vulnerabilities run in families and um, it's quite often there, you can see it. Um, and again, the chorea forms, I, I mentioned it and then someone gratefully has filled it in. These small finger flexings, or this one boy kept holding his hand, actually he kept holding it, so it wouldn't do this all the time. And the parents thought that it was just an anxiety measurement and he would um, grab his CD player and go into the bathroom for 30 to 50 minutes, 60 minutes, and that was his compulsion to manage this need to writhe his hands. So um, I also saw a beautiful video by a family who recorded their daughter picking up a potato chip and doing this and then back down and put it down. So this, that was a career form movement that she was eating but it was, would come out in the extension and the pull to her um, hand. The ticks are measured again in a formal way called the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale. It does frequency intensity interference again it's scored. Ticks are always worsened whether it's tick disorder, simple, complex, motor, vocal, Tourette, pandas, they're always, always worsened by stress, fatigue, and excitement. So if your child's excited about going somewhere, especially in the evening, especially because they've been holding it and suppressing it during the school day, they're more tired. It takes a lot of energy to sit on ticks, but you can suppress ticks, you cannot block them entirely, but you can suppress them. And so they come home and they tick a lot, but by the end of the evening, they're also tired, and so they're going to be ticking more often in the evening. This is why you don't hear it about it necessarily by the teacher. Oh, yeah, he sniffles a little bit, the teacher will say. And you hear him sniffing constantly when he gets home. Again, ticks can be suppressed but not denied, uh, and they do suppress it often during the day. There is ways of round ticks, like concentrate on something else, diverts the brain and the brain activity to some other activity. Tick support, um, often I, if I'm aware there's ticks, I've interviewed the parents before I meet the child, and then I watch for at least 20, 30 minutes before I actually interview about ticks, because it's almost a guarantee that when I ask about a tick, I will incite the tick. Same thing when you are home. If you say, have you been having any blacking today, Johnny, or are you threatening? You know, the minute you ask, all of a sudden you'll see it. That's not necessarily a reflection of how intense it was all day long, but when you, it's like a yawn. You can't watch it without doing it. If you ask about a tick, it often incites the tick. Um, and in, in tick, particularly tick Tourette, child's choices, in terms of letting them make some choices of their life as much as possible because they do not have any choices over ticks. Same thing's true with all the pandas. You know, this is taken over them. They don't have much choice or control. Another just very important note is the comorbidity of OCD and ADHD is very high, so you're often treating more than one illness if you're dealing with any of it. Um, I'm going to let you read that. All right, next thing we're going to do quickly through medication. So first you just need a little bio lesson. 
This is the presynaptic nerve right here, ending. And the three main, we're going to talk about three main neurotransmitters, also called monoamines, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. They're released by a variety of mechanisms from the first cell. They come through tubules, sit in this place called the synapse, and they're picked up on receptor sites here, which also have channels. So when you take a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, that's Paxil, Prozac, Zoloft, what you're doing is you're, the serotonin is coming out here, sitting in the space, and it's not necessarily going down enough to get to the next cell very actively, so it blocks the recycling pump called the serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It blocks that reuptake pump, allowing more serotonin to sit here, allowing more to be now accessible. Same thing happens with stimulants, same thing. It's almost, that's kind of a baseline universal concept of a lot of drug construction. The more advanced drug construction right now is moving towards the receptor sites and working on drugs that are affecting. Now the receptor sites are also often where the side effects come in. If you block a histamine receptor site, you often get tired. Antihistamine makes you tired. So if I block a histamine receptor site, it's going to make you tired. Benadryl is a good example. Um, so I'm just going to quickly move through them. You can read more details. Um, genetics affect this a lot. Transporters, re uptake inhibitors, receptors are all highly genetically influenced. We don't know yet much, but we're finding out some now. The first one is dopamine. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you've heard a lot about it because dopamine is action, reward. This is the, uh, if I give a child a stimulant with too much dopamine, I invoke a tick. I invoke an involuntary movement. And the key neurotransmitter in the basal ganglia is dopamine. So we heard about the uh, dopamine 1 and 2 receptors being uh, too active or underactive. And so dopamine is, is really a big uh, neurotransmitter in this illness that's out of whack. Serotonin is what all the antidepressants are working on. This is um, satisfaction, memory, sleep, appetite, relaxation. And very importantly, back to Dr. Bach's work, is, eight, is that 80%, if not more, serotonin is made in the gut. If your gut is messed up, your serotonin is messed up. Norepinephrine, another word for it, is noradrenaline, which is a precursor to adrenaline. This is the chemical of adrenaline. And, and it also is a chemical of attention. So if you're highly anxious and your norepinephrine is dysregulated, it's harder to pay attention. Um, and physical symptoms of norepinephrine are what I talked about earlier with anxiety. Alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, these are the medications that are used to calm the basal ganglia. In tick, this is clonidine and guanfacine, and it also works on the pathway secondary messenger systems, which I'm not going to explain, but it's outside the dopaminergic flow. It comes in through a different pathway. And this is used to treat ADHD, ticks, reactivity, impulsivity. It also lowers blood pressure, lowers heart rate. Uh, so it, even if it's, your child doesn't have a tick, these medications are sometimes used in pandas to just lower the reactivity and the impulsivity of what the child is experiencing. I'm going to not mention a whole lot of this, but glutamate and GABA are important concepts. I want to mention antioxidants for a minute because we talked about this in a different way. Inflammation causes rust, Consider it causes cell death, cell impairment, cell damage, and that's an oxidation event. Antioxidants are to clean up that rust. So one of the supplementary things you can consider doing in terms of healing is antioxidants. But again, try to get directions on these. People can just go way hog wild on supplements about what they read and what they're doing. And many of them are um, ill-prepared, too expensive, and you don't know, you need some guidance if you can. There's some really good books written with this stuff. Dr. Box would be one. Um, I'm gonna skip that, you can look later. Just remember that there's lots of drugs and new versions of drugs, but they're really the same chemical, just in a different delivery mechanism. Concerta is new version at the time of generic Ritalin. It's just a new delivery mechanism. Focalin is a new form of Ritalin. Vyvanse is a new form of Adderall, et cetera. So many drug companies are putting out new drugs, but they're actually in old chemistries that have been re-engineered in its delivery mechanism and or re-engineered slightly in the chemistry. Um, okay, so I've already mentioned these things. Um, all antidepressants, this confuses people, when I start talking about anti-anxiety medication, I'm actually starting to talk about, a lot of times, SSRIs, uh, Prozac, Paxil, Lulox, all antidepressants are also anti-anxiety. There's a very tight correlative looping in the brain with serotonin and norepinephrine. 
And then we have the antidepressants. I'm gonna talk about the three main ones because they are the ones that the FDA has approved for children in OCD, Prozac, Zoloft, and Luvox. And as I mentioned, all are used for anxiety, depression, and OCD. The dosing structures, which I'm gonna show you in a minute, are very different, however, depending on what you're treating. Anxiety medications outside of antidepressants include the benzodiazepines. This includes, increases GABA, the calming chemistry. And they're listed here. They have an issue about how long they last. Um, and they can be very helpful, especially in panic phobic states uh, where you can't move somebody along physically. They also, in some kids, backfire. If your child has a bad reaction to Benadryl, be very cautious if you're trying these drugs. I often say to the parent, could you go home and give a baby dose on a Saturday morning, see if it acts like vodka or stimulant? Um, and you'll know. Um, sedation, dizziness. Uh, clonopin, people get worried about because it does cause some cognitive blunting. But how we use them generally is not addictive. This gets to be a really fear on parents that don't want to use them. In child psychiatry literature, they talk all the time about how underused these drugs are, how we just really withhold these because we fear addiction, we fear substance abuse. These children are not getting dosed by these generally three times a day for lifetimes. So if you're using them at night to help to go to sleep, you use them in the morning and go to bed. If you do need to use them three times a day, you have to go on and off very slowly and very carefully. If you miss them and you've been on a standard dose all day long, three times a day, or two or three times a day for more than a week, you may, if you skip a dose, cause withdrawal anxiety. How much time do I have? Um, Anti-anxiety medications, uh, these are some other ones you can use. No, notice I mentioned Benadryl. Benadryl, I want to mention just that it's a good drug if you can get it in a minute of meltdown. It helps calm them, it makes them tired. You're using it as a side effect drug, meaning the side effect is sedation. And so it's kind of like giving them another stiff drink of vodka. And so one of the things in your arsenal at home, if they don't have an ad bad reaction, is Benadryl. Um, Anti-anxiety medication, this is a very underused drug. It's called periactin, also known as ciproheptadine. It mostly comes in generic form. It's wonderful for children who won't eat because it makes them more hungry. It helps go to sleep at night. It makes them more tired. It's in the Benadryl family and a histamine family. You start at four milligrams at bedtime. It helps them be hungrier the next day, many of them. If they don't get sedated, you can use it up to three times a day, and it helps increase appetite. It calms them a little bit. Sleep medications, number one is melatonin. You can use the rest of them on that page, especially the Ambien, Sonata, and Lunesta are generally not used for children. I had a patient wake up one time at a local convenience store at three in the morning. He had driven there. So it's, and these are, you know, you hear these adult stories, but generally speaking, they're not used much in children. Uh, and they're very cautiously used in adults. Um, these are other sleep medications. These are all medications used for the side effect of sedation or calming. Clonidine particularly gets the rat off the wheel and helps you shut down at night. And those are medications used for tics and also that excitability I talked about earlier. Here's some of the side effects. Antipsychotics, these are very major drugs. I'm horrified sometimes by what I see people being prescribed when they haven't been treated for pandas or it's kind of being poo-pooed. Um, they have serious side effects, but I'm a firm believer in them. I use them all the time. They have their place. These are some adjunctive treatments you'll read about. Some people have asked about MTHFR. I don't think we've talked about it yet. That's folic acid utilization enzyme. And some of our children really do need and benefit uh, from supplementation of folic acid. And in the adult depression world, they're now using it quite actively as a supportive element for treatment. Um, obsessive compulsive, we kind of talked about that, naming the bad guy. These are the medications, you'll recognize most of them for OCD and the dosing. The one I haven't mentioned is anaphronel. This is an older style uh, neurotransmitter. It has really good effect. It's very effective, but it has a little higher rate of side effects. So we usually try the th big three, Prozac, Zoloft, or Fluvox first. If we're failing on those or side effects, we move to anaphronel. But it does require some EKG. It causes a little more drying, blurred vision, constipation. But it is an excellent drug. Don't be shy about it. Um, there's been questions about the dangerousness, and I know this is on the web a lot, of any antidepressant. There are some basic facts. Antidepressants in certain people can cause agitation, including thoughts of suicide. Your risks are much higher if you have a bipolar family illness, generation one or two removed, so aunt, grandparent, parent, maybe cousin, and if your child is adopted because you have no idea 
how, what their background is most of the time, and many parents who are in bipolar states are hypersexual and they get pregnant. And so there are many children who are in treatment who have bipolar history in their family. They are much more potentially going to have that side effect, but always with neuroatypical, which includes PANDAS, you go very low and very slow. If you have a side effect with a child with PANDAS, like autism, like genetic impairment, you look in the rare and infrequent column, because that's where you're gonna sign the side effect. Um, these are some medications people are talking about now. Rosuyol is used, um, is it ALS, I think? Um, that they're trying in OCD right now. NAC has been very effective, more effective than any other drug, by the way. N-acetylcysteine is an amino acid. It's what you eat in a hamburger, but you can give it in large doses, and it's very helpful in trichotillomania, like 30, 40% improvement. That's not, there's no drug that actually matches that number. But again, these are things you try. The last thing I'm gonna give you is this is a sample letter. I've broken it up. I'm happy to email it to you for your school systems. So first you're gonna describe what PANDAS is, and then you're, there's a website that you're gonna refer them to. You list the symptoms, and then the next thing you list, and my child, by the way, has these symptoms of what's above. And then I want everybody to be alert to these things. I want people to respond quickly. I'm asking that the nurse and teacher alert you to whether anybody in the classroom has strep. And then they go, oh, we can't tell you who it is. You go, I don't need to know who it is. I just need to know they have strep. The teacher needs to know because many kids who have strep go home. It's 5 o'clock. They have a sore throat. You go to the pediatrician. You get your antibiotic. You get home. 24 hours you're there, and now you go back to school. The nurse never knows that you've had strep. The nurse might know if there's a cluster leaving school with sore throats, but make sure your teacher knows. And these are your references. Uh, for some of the good books about these, and, and I really encourage you to use these references. There's some really good ones for children for OCD and anxiety, and that's it.